Welcome to this week's Being Human. I'm delighted to say my guest today is Roman Pitchler. He's an author and an expert on product management. I've been aware of his work for a number of years. Uh, I've used it myself with clients. I've also sent people to to your site, Roman, for for resources. Um, So first of all, thank you for that and, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. Right. Now, I'm going to suspect that there are a, a certain portion of my listenership who uh, are, are perhaps less au fait with some of the, the I suppose, newer digital terms. Um, and we might say that product management or product ownership is part of that. Um, people may have an understanding of it. But just to hear from you initially, how do you define product management? How do I define product management? Yes, uh, it's a great question. Um, not necessarily a question that's uh, very easy to, to answer with just a few words. So for me, a product person, product manager, product owner, product professional is somebody who um, takes an idea and uh, brings, helps to bring that idea to life, uh, launch an initial product, and then uh, helps to make that product successful and keep it successful. So product management, in a way, is, is all about creating value, creating assets that offer value to users. Um, and in some cases to customers and to an organization, to a business, to a company. And that could be a healthcare product, it could be a, a finance product, it could be an entertainment product, it could be something in the space of media and publishing. Um, so, if, you know, products obviously take different uh, forms and shapes, but again, I'd argue that any, any product really has to address a, a specific group of people, specific beneficiaries, and has to create value for those people, solve a problem or uh, offer a specific benefit, and again, has to um, achieve certain business goals and uh, create certain business benefits. And so, again, product management really is then the 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 discipline that you know the collection of practices that support this this work you know creating value through uh, assets specific assets um, and you know in in my case uh, I very much focus on the digital space so usually you know those assets are digital products and and you mentioned in the two terms which I know get used sometimes interchangeably but perhaps it's useful to make a, a distinction here between product owner and product manager how, how do you see those as being different yes yeah thanks thanks for that question i think there's uh, still a lot of confusion really in the product management community um in uh, you know, generally, I think amongst people who work with uh, digital products, you know, is there what is the difference? You know, what between those two terms, and you know, you know what specifically are the differences? Uh, my understanding of the the product owner role, uh, certainly the Scrum product owner role, and the product owner role really emerged within the Scrum framework, has always been that essentially the the product owner is a product management role, and is very much like a product manager in an agile Scrum based setting. Um, but in, in recent years, the frameworks such as SAFE, um, SAFE is a scaling, agile scaling framework, have redefined the product owner role as very much a tactical role, which I believe is a, a misunderstanding. Um, and in practice, many, many product people, many product owners, again, very much focus on um, the tactics, the product details, managing, looking after the product backlog, interacting with the development team, maybe testing out smaller feature ideas or feature enhancements, feature improvements. Um, And to a certain extent, I'd argue that's, you know, again, down to uh, maybe not fully understanding the the idea behind behind the role, the intention behind the role, but then also the practicalities. As product people, we we have a demanding job. There's so many things that we have to do. And, uh, you know, typically the the urgent work is is, 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 is what we... uh, what we attend to, and, and that, that means answering questions from, questions from the development team, refining product backlog items to keep teams working, answering uh, important support calls or, or you know, sales requests and so forth. So I think generally there is, um, it's not only true for product owners specifically, but I think generally there's a tendency um, for us as product people that, as I said, we are sometimes a little bit too much focused on the details, too much focused on the tactics, and, and, and obviously, you know, that, that sort of bear, carries the risk that we, we lose sight of the big picture. Right. And you see that being, so, so just to come back briefly to this distinction, do you see that a product owner is really just a, a project, a product manager, but in the, the Scrum context, 
or is there still a meaningful distinction even within the agile space between those two roles or, or, or not? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, again, you know, quite a few people out there who would uh, disagree with my notion that the Scrum product owner really is a product manager in an agile Scrum based space. And that's perfectly okay. You know, in a, in a way, I think it doesn't matter so much what we, what we call, what titles we choose, what we call people, people's roles. Um, I think what, what is helpful is to recognize that in order to, um, to do a good job for users and do a good job for the business, it's, uh, it's, it's usually helpful to have people, uh, dedicated people looking after digital assets, digital products, and to ensure that those uh, people have the right qualifications, have the right skills, have the right organizational support, um, in a way the right authority and the right autonomy to, to make uh, effective decisions. So, you know, our product professionals, I think that's, that's really important. Um, and then, you know, if we call them product owners, product managers, product leaders, product X, Y, Z, um, my colleague, Rich Mirnov suggested to call, uh, you know, anybody who has a product management job, product people. And I, I quite like his suggestion and started to, to use it more and more. And that, you know, just to, to, to sort of go, go, go beyond in a way antagonistic or dualistic thinking, are you a product manager? Are you a product owner? You know, and I've worked with organizations where the product owners desperately wanted to be product managers. And I've also worked with organizations where the product managers desperately wanted to become product owners. And it's like, well, you know, does that make sense? I don't know. I don't think so. Right. So we're talking about product people here. Yes. Yeah. That'd be my preference. <laughs> and I, I read something recently about th this question of how you, you mentioned autonomy, right? And, uh, and how much accountability ought to go with that autonomy. So is, is the product person effectively running a mini profit and loss, a mini P and L for that product? Should they have still, they should take full financial responsibility for that. Or is it more that they're just concerned with the design and the delivery? You know, where, where do you see that? Yeah, yeah, and another uh, nice question. I think as, you know, as with, with other questions, the, the, the answer would be it depends. Um, I think it really does depend on the organization, but it does depend on the type of product we're talking about. So if you, uh, for instance, uh, manage a revenue generating product, possibly a collection of suites, a mini portfolio of revenue generating products, say something like uh, Microsoft Office, then I think you, you will have a different um, level of responsibility and accountability compared to somebody who manages a digital asset that maybe is a, um, a technical product like a platform that supports um, various elements of, say, a more complex website. Um, you know, so. Um, I think it's really important to to reflect on what is the product that I manage. What 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 specific what what, what type of product are we talking about? Is it revenue generating? Is it a um, directly? Does it generate revenue directly? Does it generate revenue di indirectly by um, you know helping market and sell other products, or is it then in a way a third tier product, a supporting um, internal technical product, um, and then um, find the right people to lead those products, and again give people the right level of authority and the right level of uh, accountability. Um, I mean, if you know, if you're sort of thinking of the the product manager, product owner, the product person as a, a mini CEO, I think usually that's not quite quite right. I think the 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 idea behind or the you know why why the term appeals to uh, many people, I think, is because it. It indicates that, that you know product product people need a certain level of authority and again of in terms of you know a certain level of autonomy. Um, but you know as 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 a CEO, I would have marketing and sales functions uh, are under my control, and um, that's of course not the case for product people. I mean, product people, you know, even, even those of us who are in revenue generating products, we have to align with uh, someone from marketing. We have to align with a sales rep, and we'll have to try and. Uh, guide people and uh, get some form of agreement um, and and hopefully establish shared goals so we can can move in the same direction but we we're not in a position to tell people what to do right we can't just tell the, the market to do this <laughs> stop doing that similarly with development team members similarly with other 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 people other partners that we we interact okay okay that's it yeah so so I, I i'm getting there this this point that it's perhaps not fair to give them full accountability for a P&L if they don't have uh, full autonomy across all of, all of the levers that could potentially influence that, right? If, as you say, if they're not in charge, of, if 
or don't have influence over a sales team or a marketing team directly, then we can't make them fully accountable for the for the profit and loss. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I, I mean, generally, I, I always recommend, I mean, to a certain extent, I'm repeating myself now, but I really do recommend always to start by reflecting on what asset are we talking about here? And is it a product? Is it a feature? Is it maybe something more like an architecture building block, like a component? Or is it maybe something bigger? Is it maybe a collection of products, like an aggregate product, like a complex website, for instance, sometimes is? And once you've figured out, okay, what, what are we talking about, then who is the right person to, to manage and own that product? And you know, who, should, who does the individual need to collaborate with? Um, and, and what kind of responsibility and what level of autonomy does the uh, individual need in order to be a good job? And again, then, you know, what is the specific, what is, what is the specific responsibility and what is the specific level of accountability that the individual should have? And I really think you need to, you need to, in a way, contextualize the, the conversation. Otherwise, you know, yeah, it's, it's kind of difficult to come up with, with meaningful, with helpful answers. Yeah, no, no, that, that makes sense. Um, the, so reflecting on, on what, I see of your product ownership skills in terms of your website. I, I, I love your website, right? It's, it's oh, really it's clear. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It, it, it's, uh, it, it has a sen sense of sort of cl cleanliness, if I can say that, or there's a, and there's a clarity to, to the information you're presenting. What have you, what do you think the talents that you've had to develop the most in order to be a great product person? So I, I started out um, as a, a developer. I started out uh, as, a, as a developer and programmer. And so I then uh, moved into a role where I took uh, responsibility for uh, software architecture and generally uh, helped um, business groups, um, other organizations, come up with new products and very much kind of sort of helped foster um, a technical innovation. And so for me, then moving into a product role required, um, what really helped me was to boost my general understanding of how businesses work. So I did, took an MBA type course at Open University many, many years ago. And while many of the, the specifics that I learned weren't directly applicable to what I did, generally just developing a more business um, oriented mindset and becoming more business savvy was really helpful for me. Um, and then um, I guess the second element that, that really helped me was letting go of being interested in, in how products, uh, how software digital products work and, uh, and, and really focusing on, you know, who benefits from them and, you know, who should use them and how do people use them or how do you people use current products. Um, so I do think really that generally understanding how businesses work and, and the business that you're in and um, taking a keen interest in, in the users and in a way being able to, to empathize with the, the beneficiaries of your product, that those are key skills that certainly have helped me. And I, I believe, you know, generally very, very helpful for product people. And what is it? Is, is there... Is there anything you can share specifically in terms of a, a story of where maybe you've you failed to empathize and learn something or learn how to do it differently or, or on that? Because that thing comes up in your post. It comes up in your on your book strategize. What are your key lessons in that, that area of empathy? Yeah, I mean, a, a simple example of where I uh, didn't do in a way enough, you know, product discovery, product research, strategizing, strategy validation. Um, and didn't build up enough understanding of user needs and, um, and, um, and didn't enough empathize, I think, was around uh, trying to build an uh, e-learning e -learning product. So I, I, I sort of had two or three guys at building an e-learning product and ultimately um, abandoned uh, all of them, killed all of them at a more or less uh, early stage. Um, and I remember one, one particular uh, product, that was the first one, uh, and it was very much driven by, oh, you know, we'd like to grow the business and what can we do? And e-learning seems to be an upcoming trend. So let's build something. It was very much driven from let's build it <laughs> rather than looking at, okay, so uh, who are the people who would benefit from this and who are the people who we currently serve? And is it a new market or new market segment? And, you know, how will we add more value? What is their perspective? What are their needs? 
and, and, and also what, what does it take for us not only as a business to build such a such a product but what does it does what, what it do to our um, uh, to the way that the brand the main brand is perceived so what would it do essentially to to reputation and uh, brand equity um, so yeah it was very much uh, a mistake around being um, getting excited getting very excited to do something be creative and uh, get going um, and I, I noticed that something that that many many product people are in a way um, you know, know prone to do to a certain extent um, you know, it's kind of great to 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 offer something. It's kind of create to to to, to um, uh, build something new, be it a, a brand new product, be it new features, new capabilities, enhanced features, and then sometimes that we can just get carried away, right? And um, you know, think oh, it'll be amazing once once we've got this done and once we've uh, finished this this amazing product, people will just come and they'll just they'll just want it. Yeah, you know? but but of yeah. course that's usually not how it works. Um, so I don't know if, if if that if that was helpful. I mean, em empathy for me is 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 nothing nothing big. It it really means, uh, you know, the, the the willingness to 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 take a keen interest uh, in in someone and to come from a place of curiosity and, and care and and be, be be willing to take perspective and figure out what it might be like for the other person. You know, what is her or his experience like, and you know, what are who are his feelings and thoughts and particularly what are the underlying needs and interests of the other person. And I think it's so crucial uh, to us as product people, first of all, in order to uh, understand if there's a market for our product and, um, you know, who the right users and customers are and what the right needs are, the right problem is, the right benefits are that we should offer. Um, but also then to um, interact with uh, development teams and stakeholders in the right way. Um, you know, empathy, I think, really helps us to, to build trust and, and create an environment where people feel safe to speak their mind and you know, be themselves and don't have to sort of try and, and pretend or hold back or you know, filter all the time. So, yeah, for me, it's, uh, it's maybe, maybe, maybe one of the, the most uh, important qualities or, or capabilities that product people, people can, can, can develop. And by developing, I mean, in a, in a way, cultivating and strengthening because we all have the, the capacity to care about others. And, you know, to a certain extent, be warm-hearted. It's just something that, again, you know, we, we have to, you know, we, we maybe have to train a little bit, have to work on a little bit. Some of us more, some of us less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and given your e-learning experience that you, you've shared there, what did you specifically have to train yourself on to create that, that empathetic environment? So for me, it's really reminding myself, why am I ultimately doing what I'm doing? Um, and I do think, you know, that should be, uh, you know, that, that should, should generally be helpful for product people. You know, why are we doing what we're doing? Um, is it to foster my own career? Is it to earn a lot of money? Is it to climb up the social ladder? Is it to buy a bigger car, buy a new house? Or is it that we're trying ultimately to create something that benefits people and, and therefore hopefully in one way or another enhance and enrich people's lives. And I think if that's the perspective you take, then in a way that has a very liberating effect, at least on me, because I no longer kind of, you know, I'm no longer so driven and so like, oh, you know, I've got to achieve this or, you know, I've got to build this. And, and there are no longer quite so many wants and musts and shoulds. Um, but it's, it's, it's that sort of empathetic, altruistic perspective, um, you know, it, it, it opens up and liberates me in the sense that it's 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 not it's again it's not only about me it's it's about other people and how can I help other people, and I think that's um, and I think ultimately that's why we should be in business as product people. We should be in business to to help people and create value for 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 human beings and by creating value for human beings, whatever that value might be, you know, hopefully also then benefit our businesses. But for me, it, you know, ultimately, it, it always has to start with the, the user. Who are the users and what are their interests? And, you know, I mean. And, and people will pick up on that, right? If that's your stance and then your attitude, people will detect that when they interact I, with you. Yes. Yeah, I, I do think so. I do think so. And, you know, sometimes reflecting on how product management has evolved over the last 10, 15 years, I sometimes, you know, when I started taking some real interest in product management, sort of in the early noughties. Do we still say noughties? <laughs> Sounds so naughty. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know if, uh, what year are we in now? 18 years ago or something? 
um, it was it certainly the experience I had is was very sort of, kind of sort of heavyweight, sequential. Um, you know, lots of upfront marketing and research. Uh, you know, people would do sort of ethnographic research and spend time, a lot of time with uh, target users or, or actual users and customers. Um, you know, the stories about um, that I read about Lego. I'm not sure if, if if those stories are true, and I'm not sure if Lego still does it. But you know, Lego researchers moving in with families in their main target markets and actually studying how kids play not only with Lego but you know various toys. And so there was a lot of a lot of focus on uh, really um, you know kind of deep research and understanding users and and of course that is very expensive and of course you're making a bet particularly when you're developing a new product and you're investing all that time money and energy and I think what's kind of happened with agile and particularly then uh, lean startup is that the pendulum's kind of swung to the other extremes so to speak that's at least my impression where we kind of say like, yeah, users, yeah, right. But I mean, we've got a cool idea. Let's experiment. Let's validate very quickly. Let's get throw something out, see if it sticks. If it doesn't stick, don't worry. We'll have another idea. We'll throw something else out. And so I think as, as often in life, the, you know, it's a happy medium. It's we don't want to spend too much time with upfront market and user research. We don't want to either do any, any, any type of discovery activities. But I think at the same time, if it's, just about churning out more and more, you know, fake products or prototypes or MVPs, um, and, and just just literally trying what could possibly work. Then, then we do lack this. This um, we do we we we, we kind of um, we, we lack the the ability to truly understand the users and empathize with them because we just haven't taken the time to talk to people, to observe people, um, to listen to people. And um, yeah, that's at least my impression. <laughs> I think you're making a good point here. We don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. I mean, my impression of that, all of that upfront work that, as you say, was so prevalent in the noughties was that uh, there was a lot of documentation. There was a lot of just writing stuff down, you know, writing down the requirements ad nauseum and so on. Um, but perhaps one of the really valuable parts of that was actually just the, those conversations which led to all that documentation, which, which I suppose at their best were very empathetic and, and, and really had a, an intent to understand the needs of the user. Um, so let's not lose that part of it, right? I, I think that's what you're saying. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I see that. Uh, so empathy, really important part of, I sort of, you could say one's role as a, as a leader, right? as, a, as, a product, as a product leader. Um, you also talk in one of your posts around different leadership styles of a product person. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about your, your take on, on leadership and particularly these styles and, and why you think they're important. Yes. Uh, so leadership styles, I mean, a leadership, you know, leadership style really just refers to a, a common set of uh, behavior, of uh, leadership behavior. And, you know, people over the years have identified various styles from something like being visionary and um, guiding people through um, a shared vision, a shared inspiring overarching goal. Um, you know, something like being uh, democratic or participatory or inclusive, where you try and involve people in, this, in, in key decisions. Um, you know, something like being uh, authoritarian and coercive, where you, you practice more command and control type style. And so, in, you know, what I find helpful about those uh, styles is that they offer... So first of all, they, in my mind, they encourage uh, a reflection on, on, you know, what leadership behaviors do I see and, um, in others and in myself? And what are, what are my ideas about uh, leadership? Uh, just, just to give you an example from my, uh, from my own work or, um, yes, from my, my own career, so to speak, is um, quite a while back, I was uh, invited uh, to attend an assessment center. And at that time, I was working for quite a big company. And uh, it was, was, uh, it was in very interesting. It was a very intense, like, uh, I think it was like four or five days, uh, which is a very small group of us. Uh, and we were sort of working all day and even into the, into the late into the, the, the evening. Um, and one of the tasks that we were set was a, a role play where we uh, had to act as the, 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 the boss, the manager, the leader, and deal with a difficult employee. And... Um, the, the feedback I then received at the end of the, 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 the assessment center was generally quite positive. But one of the things that the assessors picked up on is that they said to me, oh, yes, and in this role play, you weren't um, decisive enough. You weren't directive enough. You weren't assertive enough. And that surprised me for two reasons, because <laughs> usually 
people who know me uh, don't complain that I l lack assertiveness. <laughs> um, and, and secondly, I, I, um, I guess more importantly, um, I really don't believe, and I didn't believe back then, and I still don't believe that being an effective leader means being overly assertive or authoritarian or you know, um, acting in a, in a very sort of commanding way. But that was very much the idea, the leadership idea that the assessors seemed to seem to favor. So they seemed to, to lean for whatever reason towards that uh, leadership behavior, towards those leadership styles. But I think um, another, another takeaway when it comes to looking at leadership styles for me is another important insight is that there is no one right way to lead people. Um, different behaviors, different leadership behaviors ha are more or less applicable in different situations. So for instance, uh, a visionary leadership style uh, might work best when uh, you, you develop something new. It could be a brand new product or it could be a major update of an existing product. Um, and, and maybe when people are, are skilled enough to figure out the details so that you, you, you set a vision, you, you give people a, a more bigger overarching goals. And again, you know, people can, can then uh, decide what specific step they have to take in order to, to work towards that goal. But if you're in a crisis situation, if uh, you, your product is, is uh, one of the major cash cows of the company and um, you know, currently there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a major bug that the product is experiencing in production, then you may not want to be overly um, visionary and say like, well, you know, we'll figure it out and oh, we have this goal to make everyone happy and oh, well, you know, it'll all work out. You probably want to be a little bit more hands-on, a little bit more directive. I'm not saying you should be coercive, but you know, certainly, you know, you know, what's, what, what some people would refer to as, as sort of, you know, be, 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 be assertive or, you know, mentor or, or, or do some pace setting where you, you try and take people by the hand and say, look, I really think this is what we should be doing now. Um, so yes, yeah, um, I think ultimately it's really about being in tune and being attentive to the needs of the people who we lead. So, you know, in a product context, that is, you know, what are the needs uh, of the development team and the stakeholders? And that is influenced by how much do they know. If you work with a, a development team where people know a lot about the product, the market, the domain, then you know, they, 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 they need less support. And you can be, in a way, a little bit more uh, delegative, a little bit more less fair. If it's a new team or if people haven't worked together, if they don't know much about the product, uh, then again, they need a little bit more support. So you'll have to mentor a little bit. You'll have to coach them a little bit more. And the same is true with the, the, the stakeholders. And the second, the second factor here in my mind is um, how cohesive, cohesive is the group? Has a team gelled? And you know, have, have you worked with the stakeholders for a certain period of time and established a rapport, a good, trustful working relationship or not? And that will also then influence the leadership style. And of course, the, the general setting, you know, the, the general company culture ultimately and the values and what kind of leadership behaviors is seen as, as acceptable. Uh, that's not the same in, in every organization either. So yeah, be, be attentive, that's my, my, would be my advice, be attentive to the needs of the people who you lead and just be aware of the organizational context you're in. Right. And has so there been an answer, right? Yeah, no, no, I, I, and it's interesting because I interviewed a guy who, uh, in the States who'd done a lot of research on different leaders and, and looked for those leaders and the name of his book is called Super Bosses and those leaders that had not just been very successful in their field, but had also spawned um, a bunch of very successful leaders who had worked for that individual. And I got a little bit of pushback on social media having released the episode because one of these, these styles was the sort of ball busting uh, boss who just wants to win and he doesn't really care about you. He, he, but if you're going to help him win or her win, then, then, then you can you can you can come with him or her, and he called this style the glorious bastard, mm -hmm. and 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 I, although I kind of winced at this description and found it very difficult to accept that that could be, uh, a, you know, a powerful way to be and could be of service to the people around um, that person. Uh, I thought, well, kind of fair enough, right? If it, if it works in that context if it's not kind of overtly abusive of people, uh, mm. why not? And, and this, this individual said, you know, it might be that this is an, that kind of experience you don't want to have for your whole career, but a, a few years working for somebody like that might provide something for you. And I, I 
pretty much bought what he was was saying but yeah there was there was this individual on social media who was like you know i can't believe you you know you've you've endorsed this this mm. position and are you saying something similar here that it's it's all about context or are there kind of red lines for you where you just think no certain styles just don't work ever well i do think it's about context but i think it's really about um you know bringing awareness to who are the people um who i lead um you know who are those individuals who are those groups and again you know what what needs do they have and what needs do they have at present and how can i, I mean for me leadership really means guiding people helping people to reach shared goals and that that means uh, to a certain extent influencing people it means to a certain extent encouraging positive change in individuals but it's it's very much i very much see any anybody who wants to exercise leadership as somebody who supports as somebody who helps as somebody who guides so I think um, as, 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 a, as a leader, our interest uh, should always be with the, the other people. And again, you know, we should always try and uh, empathize with the individuals and choose the, the leadership uh, approach, style, behavior that is most helpful in a given situation. But then I, I also think we have to find a way to lead others that is, um, is healthy and sustainable for, for ourselves. And, um, and I think... I think what 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 is what is very challenging. One of the things that is very challenging for for product people in general is that we're so busy that there's so much happening, and you know we we have to we, ideally we should attend to strategy, we should attend to tactics, we should work with stakeholders, internal stakeholders, and the development team. We should uh, talk to users and customers. You know, there's so many aspects to our work, and uh, it's all too easy just in a way, um, you know, keep ourselves super 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 busy and and not stop and reflect. But I think if we do take the time and, and make, make time for reflection and, then, and, and become a little bit aware of how, how, how are we doing and, and how is it going for us and you know, how's, how's leading the development team and stakeholders been lately for us? Um, are we getting stressed? Are we tense? Are we worried? Is there some anxiety? Then you know, those, those, those emotions, those feelings are important clues, important clues about um, if, if our approach, if our work, if our work and approach is healthy, or if there's maybe something that we, we should change. So I would argue if you are a, um, if you're more on the commanding, authoritarian, coercive side for um, a certain period of time, you, you should feel that there's tension in you and you should feel that there is um, maybe, maybe also an element of, of stress or possibly aversion. And if that's what you notice, then again, I'd say that's, that's an important clue. And, you know, that's then something probably to consider and act upon. But I generally think it's very difficult to say people, or I think it's impossible. And personally, I would even argue it's probably inappropriate to say to people, this is how you should lead. <laughs> this is how you should do your work. I think all that's possible is, is to offer options and, you know, for instance, certain leadership styles and behaviors, and then um, an indication when those styles are more or less helpful and then ultimately every one of us has to choose for her or himself what is most helpful in a given situation yeah and, and what i i think what i heard there which was consistent with your early, uh, earlier answer was actually something about care taking an interest and care for the people around you and yourself right you, you talked about that's right yourself that's right yeah, and, and you know, maybe maybe it's just me, but I can get very driven. I can be can get very focused on must achieve this, must do this. Um, but I think generally, you know, in, in product, but 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 in our society, I mean, we are conditioned to define ourselves through what we've achieved, through what we have, what we know, who we are, and what we do. Um, and so it can be can be very easy to 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 be caught up in all those goals and ideas about you know what I, what you want to do with your product, but also maybe some some personal objectives, some personal new goals you have around salary increases, bonuses, career progression. You know, to a certain extent, it's only natural. And then I think it's also helpful to recognize that and step away from it, and and, and again ask why am I in this job? Is it is it primarily to earn a lot of money? But maybe there are other jobs where I can earn more money more quickly, or is it to create value for others? And if it's the the latter, then you know, do I do I care enough? <laughs> and yes, as you said, do I care care enough about others and and myself? Yes, yeah, yeah. I I, I think that's. Uh... Uh, a a useful inquiry to continue to return to this this idea of of care yeah, yeah I like it uh, you talk uh, specifically about um, 
in the context of, of leading and I suppose managing uh, decision rules. Can you talk a bit, a bit about that and mm -hmm. this as well on that avenue? Yes, yeah. So uh, decision making is a, a topic I've become increasingly interested in in, in recent years. Um, the reason being that, um, I mean, there, there are a number of uh, decisions as product people that we can take and should take on our own. I mean, I don't know, deciding to say uh, refine a user story um, or break an epic into multiple user stories or I don't know, kick maybe an old product backlog item out of the product backlog. I mean, those are all kind of, you know, day to day decisions that we take and, you know, we just, we don't consult other people, we don't involve other people, that's, that's perfectly cool. However, uh, the bigger product decisions I find that, that usually as product people, we do involve others. We do involve development team members, we do involve stakeholders. Um, you know, if you develop a bespoke uh, custom client specific product, you would involve a, a client or customer representative. And so, um, in order to make uh, effective collaborative or participatory decisions, I think one of the elements that is important to, to get right is uh, choose the right uh, decision making rule. And you know, the, the, the various rules that, that, that people can use um, that, that, that you know, are available to us, for instance, one of them will be uh, consent, which um, you know, has become quite popular in recent years. Uh, and consent basically means anybody who's involved in the decision making process doesn't have any meaningful objections. But the assumption is that everybody is, is able to speak her or his mind. Nobody feels encouraged or forced in one way or the other to, uh, um, you know, say, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's going to be okay. Um, and, um, and, and the nice thing about a content is that it tends to be um, comparatively um, quick to achieve content that people say, that's okay. You know, I'm, I may not fully and wholeheartedly support it and endorse it, but it's, it's okay with me. It's good enough for now. Let's go with it. Um, um, and um, yeah, offers usually often strong enough support, yeah. but then you have something like unanimous agreement where everybody says, this is amazing. This is a wonderful idea. We should definitely do it. <laughs> um, and sometimes people, you know, um, say, refer to, to unanimous agreement as consensus, but, from the books that I've read, the research I've done is that there's a difference between consensus and unanimous agreement. I used to mix up the two myself. Consensus simply means agreement. Unanimous agreement means everybody is in agreement. So it's not only good enough that nobody is against it, everybody has to be for it and, and really support it. You know, and then there are things like uh, majority um, and using a majority in order to determine if uh, a decision should be made or not. But um, I guess uh, here in the UK, we've had our own experiences with majority votes in recent years. So it's something maybe to be a little bit, uh, to, to use carefully. And uh, if it's a really important decision, maybe use super majority, which means you shoot not only for a 50% um, majority of, you know, just over 50, but you, you say like, oh, at least 60 or 75 or 80%. Otherwise, you know, we, the proposal it doesn't, it isn't, isn't, it doesn't get accepted and we're not gonna go ahead with the idea. So those, those would be you know, specific decision-making rules. And the, the idea is that by, by, by choosing such a rule, you, you decide um, who makes a decision and how is the decision made. So it's clear to people you know, that a decision actually has been made and should be actioned now. Um, and it, it also, in a way, uh, decides how inclusive you want to be. So something like unanimous decision really it, it means that you, you have to not only carefully listen to everyone involved in the decision-making process, but you really have to find an inclusive solution together. Whereas, um, you know, something like content means you just have to find um, a solution that is okay for everyone, that nobody is against, you know, again, making sure that everybody's been, been listened to and everybody's had her or his say. So, yeah, for me, it, that, that's something very useful. And I, I feel in, in practice, it's something also very practical that often product people kind of overlook. Um, you know, if you're fortunate enough that you have an agile coach or scrum master working with you, then Maybe the, the individual will point it out to you. But yeah, for me, it's, 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 it's helpful. It's helpful in terms of leadership practice, leadership techniques, uh, leading the development team and the stakeholders to you know, be aware of how, how we can make decisions together in such a way that you know, people support them and they, they actually do get implemented. Yeah, and I can see how kind of setting, setting up rules for making decisions uh, is actually a really important practice because often I see with the clients I work with the uh, a problem is that the product owner or product manager will get bombarded with requests uh, and sometimes they're just even if they want to say no they feel they can't say no and then they push 
push that down to the development team and, and the development field team feel like they're being pushed and pulled and they don't have, you know, that seems to be a, a kind of common anti-pattern of, uh, of, of product management. Um, am I right that having something like this set up with a, with a, group, with a lot of buy-in across the organization as this is the mode we'll use can help with that? Yeah, I think so. Even though, um, in the example that you stated, and you know what you said very much resonates with me, and, and you know matches my experience. I think there's more to it. As there's, there's usually in, in, in my experience an element of um, uh, um, how should I best put this? Authority empowerment and establishing um, the product roles in the organization. You know, so you know historically many. Uh, Many, 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 many verticals, many industries take, uh, um, say, um, you know, banks and insurance companies, uh, media companies, um, uh, travel companies. Um, um, you know, you don't don't have any product management. Certainly, not a not a digital product management. And so, you know, when you then start working as a, a product person in, in one of those organizations, then it, you often face an uphill battle in terms of uh, getting recognized and, and getting some respect and people simply understanding. Who are you? And that you are not meant to be a feature broker. You're not just meant to be a mediator who goes from stakeholder to stakeholder and says, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And then somehow try and get all these, you know, diverse ideas and requests under one kind of um, umbrella and combine them all and create this amazing product. Um, but, but that, you know, as the, the person in charge of the product, you should actually own the product and it should be your responsibility to innovate. It should be your responsibility together with the development team to come up with um, meaningful features and you know discover what is the right user experience that should be offered. Um, so I think there's an element you know around sort of essentially the organizational understanding and the product management maturity. And then I sometimes see there's also an element around uh, skills and generally qualifications. Um, you know, product management is a comparatively young discipline, and we've had an influx of a huge influx of new people over the last few years, which is exciting. But sometimes people just, in a way, um, lack some 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 the necessary skills. I mean, it, you know, it might be around conversation skills and you know being able to attentively and actively and deeply listen listening to stakeholders and and and, and thank them for their ideas. But at the same time, then you know, be firm and say no in in a kind but again, you know, in a firm way and and push back. Um, or you know things around product strategy, which is I guess more a technical skill, a hard skill, understanding in, in, that in order to be, in, evaluate requests from from stakeholders or various people in the organisation, it may be helpful to have an overarching guiding strategy and a product roadmap in place, and use those plans, those artifacts, then to to a certain extent align people um, and, and filter any any requests that uh, people people have. Um, so. Uh, for me personally, I'd say decision rules is probably, I mean, the, certainly that's the way I've used them. Um, you know, it's, it's really how can you, together with the development team members and the stakeholders, make collaborative decisions that are meaningful without spending hours and hours and days and days, you know, um, talking about this again and again and again and without having one person dominate, you know, possibly the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion, you know, that person then might, might win. Um, or you know, people checking out and just sitting there and you know, staring at their at their phones or something, or you know, just not wanting to be there. But how can you engage people? How can you have meaningful put in, in meetings and, and make decisions that people support? Um, yeah, how is that possible? And again, decision rules for me is a is a key element in in having having those kind of meetings. Okay, and and the. And the point about the, the product owner or product manager getting pushed around is actually, it sounds like a, a much broader question in terms of how that role is, is, is A, uh, acknowledged by the rest of the organization and B, is, um, is fulfilled by someone with the right skills. I'd say so, yes. Uh, certainly those are um, aspects I would consider in, in addition to you know, how a decision is made, made and you know, what are the specific decision rules being used. Yeah, no, no, I can, I can see that. But I can also see how this is a leap for certain organizations is, is to kind of let go of that baby and just say, no, that's the product owners or the, or the, or the, or the project product managers gig. <laughs> I'm going to leave them alone. I'm going to trust them to make the right decisions. Uh, that's, a, that's a big, 
that's a big leap. In fact, I, one of my past guests uh, runs a company called Happy, and um, one of his big um, missions recently has been to not take decisions, and he has these sort of 30-day periods where he just won't make a decision. And one of the things he did was not get at all involved in a complete rebuild of the company's website. He completely let it go and empowered a product owner to run the whole thing. And he got to see the website the night before it went live. That's, I think that's the type of maturity you might be alluding to in terms of organizations um, empowering that role. Yes, yeah, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of truth in what you've said. It's, it's about being, being willing to let go and, and trusting other people. But then at the same time, of course, you know, trust has to be earned. It's difficult to trust somebody if I'm not um, you know, fairly, fairly certain that the individual is, can cope with the job and can cope with the responsibility. So, you know, allowing people to um, uh, or investing in people and supporting people and helping people learn and grow and develop. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's key in order then to, 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 to be able to, to actually put people in that position and let go and let product people um, run, run products together with the development teams and you know, with the help of the right, right stakeholders. Okay, um, I'm thinking about people who are listening to this and are maybe in a transition point uh, uh, and they may be thinking about taking on a product ownership role or been asked to do that um what do you tend where do you tend to point people who are just new getting into this so i find it always helpful um to start by reflecting on the skills the product related skills that people have and so um you know that that sort of two types of skills that i feel you know, we, we, we need to do a good job as, 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 product, as product professionals. The first one is knowing about the product and the markets and the specific industry we're in and, you know, uh, get to know the users, understand the competition, be aware of major trends, you know, be they uh, technological in nature or regulatory or consumer trends. Um, and and, and this, that's something that, first of all, most product people are quite good at. In my experience, and secondly, that's something that you just have to acquire for any kind of product that you that you start to look after, that you start to manage. So that's one 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 set of skills, and then the other set of skills uh, really are more transferable. You know, those are capabilities that allow you to manage virtually any product. Things like understanding what, say, product discovery is and how it differs from uh, product development, for instance, what a product strategy is, what a product roadmap is you know, what roadmap formats there maybe are, how you can build uh, an actionable product roadmap, how often you should review it, what a product backlog is, how you can prioritize it, what a user story is, what a persona is, you know, those kind of skills. Um, and, you know, th those are kind of kind of useful to, to reflect on and, and in a way uh, analyze a little bit. And you can break them down, or at least that's how I like to do it, into three subsets and um, identify specific tactical skills, uh, strategic skills, and then leadership or people skills. And so, you know, we, we talked about empathy quite a bit, that be a leadership skills, decision-making will be another leadership related kind of capability, but, you know, strategy, roadmap, business model, um, you know, being generally business savvy or understanding how businesses work will be probably more related to strategic skills and then product backlog, user stories, um, you know, validating ideas for individual uh, feature enhancements will probably more um, uh, tactical skills. And so, you know, by, by essentially thinking about, you know, what skills are there and where are my strengths and weaknesses, you can then baseline your skills and, and based on that, um, you know, think about in order then to be able to play a specific product role uh, or be, be hired for a specific product role, you know, where are the biggest gaps, what skills do I, should I, should I, should I uh, develop? So that's at least the way I like to, to, to do it and what I'd like to suggest in. I mean, this is uh, not meant to be a plug, but there's a, a free uh, web app available on my, uh, my website that allows people to assess their skills. It's a little product management test, but it's really a self-assessment. I mean, with, with all those kind of tests, assessments, the most important thing is to be honest to yourself and not, not sort of say, this is what I'd like to be able to do or what I think I should maybe be able to do, but what, I'm, what, I, what can I currently do you know, confidently? What can I really do? Um, so yeah, maybe maybe that's a, a, a starting point for some of the some of the listeners. Okay, uh, and that site for people, it's romanpitchler dot com. That's it. Yes, that's right. Uh, and the book, 
of people is, I'll put it for those watching, strategize, available at all good booksellers, and your blog post, right? Let's not forget the blog post. You've got a wealth of uh, a very well written, a very digestible uh, blog posts, and a bunch of resources. Some of the canvases I'm, I've used in pra practice and can attest to their uh, usefulness. Yes, it's a uh, it's a wealth uh, of resource. There. Anything else that you would suggest for people getting getting into this resource wise? I mean, it's it's natural when you start out in product management that you you want to acquire the the necessary kind of hard skills or technical skills. You know, you can you know, product mapping, strategy, product backlog, um, and it's 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 often the right starting point. But I think what what then really differentiates. Um, um, I don't know if successful is the right term, but, but I'll, I'll use it anyway. What, success, what differentiates people who are really successful in, in the product management profession are, are, is the ability to strengthen and, and develop the necessary people and leadership skills. Um, you know, in one of, my, one of my workshops, I've been uh, doing, running the same exercise now for a number of years where I asked the, the attendees, you know, you and I are in charge of hiring uh, more product people. Is, you know, your business is growing and so you got to think about interview questions and you got to think about how you're going to evaluate the candidates and what would be the most important skills that you'd be looking for and you know across the years across you know different uh, workshops in different countries um you know the the, the sort of the, the, you know the, the vast majority of answers are all around soft skills they're all around people skills all around leadership skills things like you know again empathy active listening being decisive, making decisions, but um, being inclusive, um, you know, building building trust, you know, showing respect to people, being honest, acting with integrity. Um, so for me, that's uh, a, 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 there's a massive opportunity to to develop those skills. And the nicest thing about those those skills is that they come for free. We all have them. We just need to pay attention to them and strengthen them, and in, in some case, you know, de-dust them and, and maybe, maybe maybe work on us a little bit. And not only will it make us more effective as product people, I, I would argue that it would that it will make us generally more more happy. Um, uh, uh, you know, if we're more concerned for others, if we're more open to the uh, more in tune with the needs of others, then we, we become in a way less entrapped in our own uh, you know stories and in our own thinking and a little bit less selfish. And I found that to be quite an enriching experience. Uh, an experience that, that that you know brings a level of contentment or happiness with it. So yeah, that's something I would recommend, particularly to those uh, to those listeners uh, who uh, who maybe a little bit further further down the career and have mastered sort of the, the kind of the basic product management skills. Then, then I'd say maybe then there's an opportunity to brush up on your your people and leadership skills. Right, and I must say that when I when I see all of the because on your website there's a lot of photos of you in workshops, you always look incredibly zen. Right, you've got this aura of of um, contentment and, and happiness that seems to seep through. Um, so it seems to me that you've done a lot of work in, in that area. Oh, that's nice of you. Nice of you to say that, Richard. I, I don't know if, uh, if that's how I feel inside, at least most of the time. But, <laughs> you know, I, I do think for me, um, you know, taking time to reflect and particularly um, uh, mindfulness practice and meditation practice has been extremely valuable. I sometimes think that I wouldn't have been able to do my job over the years if uh, if I hadn't started uh, meditation many years ago. So for me, that's that's been really really helpful in terms of personal development and, and you know professional development, um, and, and, and you know putting things into perspective, uh, not getting too. I mean, I, I do anyway, and I think most of us do. You know, get get very excited about things, or you know, people criticize somebody criticizes uh, something I've done, and I. You know, get angry. I feel really down. I feel really bad. But by 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 taking some time to reflect and, and having having a regular regular practice of kind of stillness or mindfulness and reflection, I think that allows you to to digest those kind of emotions and, and to become aware of them and 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 and, and to a certain extent to, to relate to them differently. And they maybe become maybe it's become helped me become a little bit calmer over the years. But there's still a long way to go. <laughs> But if, if, you'd have, if I would have placed a bet, a, a sizable bet, if someone asked me, does, does, that, does, that, guy do, uh, does that guy meditate? I, I would have put at least a thousand pounds on it that you did that. That's just my sense. Uh, so how often are you, are you a daily practicer? 
I try and meditate on a daily basis, yes. Um, it doesn't always work out, but I mean, for me, meditation is just a formal mindfulness practice. So it's sometimes I find just checking in with myself um, and giving myself little breaks and not trying to overdo it or you know, taking a longer lunch break and um, you know going for a walk or I, I like to go for a ride if I can every now and then. That's really nice because it, it, it takes me out of my work context and it, it allows me to, to relax and it allows me again to become a little bit, bit aware of what is happening and you know what's kind of, what kind of thoughts uh, do I have and, and what thoughts come up, what kind of emotions are present and um, why is that? You know, how can I, how can I relate to those thoughts? How can I relate to those emotions? And, um, you know, uh, and that often, 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 um, helps me move on. And it often then resolves things just by, by, by bringing some awareness and attention to, you know, some concerns or some ideas, you know, um, some, 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 some worries or, you know, some, some, some excitement that might be there. Well, there you go. Meditation for products product owners maybe that's uh <laughs> that's uh an offering yeah no it's uh it, it's good to hear that and I'm, I'm very impressed with the with the discipline i must say i'm uh, I, I you know i'm somebody who tries to meditate um but uh and i go through phases of being better at it and less good at it it's uh so i suppose it's, it's a life well, it's certainly for me it's a sort of uh something i keep coming back to that's right yes and i think it's you know um um it's it's easy to to bring kind of um a goal oriented or the thinking of certain drivenness to meditation and think about i must meditate and i must achieve i mean i i went through i think years uh, where i thought um if i'm not having if i'm not able to calm my mind and if there's not an element of stillness and relaxation then I'm not having a good meditation experience. So I had this kind of really firm idea of what good is and what a good experience is and what a good meditation experience is until I finally realized that, you know, that is wrong. And, you know, meditation is not about having a specific experience or, you know, chilling out or spacing out or whatever. It's about becoming aware of what is present. And if I'm restless, if I'm anxious, if I'm worried, if I'm worked up, if I'm very excited and energetic, depending on what happened during the day, what happened at work, but maybe also what's happening with my family, then that's that's the point. The point is um, the point is, is is to develop that awareness and that acceptance. And the nice thing for me by by developing this acceptance or trying to that that makes me more accepting of myself, but it also makes me more accepting of other people. Uh, and again, you know, it sort of then um, makes it easier maybe to, uh, to, 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 to bring up or develop empathy, even if I don't necessarily like the person or even if I disagree with what the person is saying. Right. Yeah, I, I can see it. I can see how, uh, how, how that could be a really powerful um, capacity in, in taking on, on, the, on a product role, as you say, a, a role which has such a, a strong requirement for, for empathy. Uh, and I suppose not getting triggered, right? That's the other part of this is not getting, not getting too caught up in my own stuff when I hear an opinion from somebody that I'm in dialogue with about a feature or whatever it might be. Yeah, I can see that. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I feel like it's been a real tour of your wisdom and, and your philosophy. Uh, so I, I really thank you for that. I, I hope that... Uh, that my listeners get some some needs met in in listening to this show so thank you yeah so it's been a pleasure it was really nice chatting to you richard thank you for having me and yes thank but, you and we'll put the links to 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 the to the site in the in the description okay thanks roman thank you